it's interesting, she's walked straight past the tree. Yeah, Teresa, you say nauseous is your word. I, yeah, there's a certain sense of that in me as well. She's going back to the kill. Yeah, I think she's heading straight back to the kill. I also think that this little one hasn't called her. Unless she knows the little one's here and is just kind of saying, well, stay there if you want to, but we can go back to the kill if you want to. Whew. The hyena, I'm just going to point out, we're not going to try and get a film of it, it's over there, basically where VM's pointing the camera. And it's been attracted, I think, by the noise. I don't think it would pick up the smell of the kill. And I don't know where the other little cub is. I thought I saw it heading down this way. Phew! Alright, I'm just going to let Aubrey move away. And then we also will decide whether we're going to try and get a better view of the cub or leave the cub alone and go back with the mum. I think it will probably be the latter. There's the hyena. Uh, you see it there, Vimpy? It's just to the left of the bottom of this marula tree there, that mar oh, I've parked you right in front of a stick. Can you just do, yeah, it's in there exactly where you, where you're filming, just to the right of that. There, it's moving now to the left. That's coming now. Got it, there we are. Now, Sean, you're wondering if the hyenas would chase the baboons. Uh, yes, because they're in a group, they are a lot braver. They can afford to be injured more than a leopard can. Remember, the big thing about what we're observing here... Sorry, quickly back to the leopard, VMP, it's coming out the tree. Um, Sean, a leopard cannot be injured. If a leopard gets injured, it cannot hunt, it will die. A hyena can afford to be injured, it lives in a group, it scavenges a lot more, and so it can take more risks than a leopard can. Now, a hyena, the one like the one you've just seen, Looks like a sub-adult male to me, from this distance. It's going to struggle to ward off baboons, but it'll turn and fight much more than a leopard will. And I think you'll find that the reason the baboon didn't push home the attack on this little cub is that although it's only eight months old, it's about the size of, say, a large Alsatian, uh, a dog, it's, it's still formidable. I mean, you wouldn't want to try and catch one of those things, it would tear you to pieces. And so, although the baboon was happy to give it a fright, he would have thought twice about actually engaging in a full pitched battle. The leopard is not going to come out because the hyena is just over there. It's coming closer and closer towards us now. And there is no danger now to the leopard from the hyena. The hyena is utterly innocuous as a threat in comparison with those baboons. You can smell something is up. Doesn't know what's gone down here. Has heard the alarm calling baboons. That's probably what uh, attracted it into this area in the first place. I don't think it spotted the leopard. The leopard has definitely spotted the hyena. I can see it watching the hyena. So it's fully aware of that threat. But it's completely safe up in the tree now. The baboons have moved off. So Hosanna is fine, and like I say, if there had been contact between the baboon and the leopard, we would have known about it. So I think everything's okay. That's right, he's now, that base of the tree on the right hand side of your screen is exactly the tree that Hosanna is sitting in. And <laughs> 
hyena is behind the eight ball here. It knows something has gone down, but it's not quite sure what. So nice to see a hyena here. You know, I've missed them so much since their den moved. Poor little leopard. God, didn't he look miserable with his little ears flattened against his head up top there? And just wanted to give him a bit of a cuddle. Like I say, you don't want to be cuddling a little leopard. Now, you're all quite stressed still about Shongile. I think Shongile is fine, everybody. I'm pretty sure that she made it away. There would have been much more of a scuffle if the baboons had actually got hold of her. This is the one that the big male focused on, and therefore I'm pretty sure that the female, I'm 90% sure that the female got away. She might actually be back at the kill with mum. What do you want? What do you want? Tobias, a good one from you about baboons and whether they have claws or if it's just the teeth that you have to worry about if you happen to be a leopard that's being chased by them. Uh, they've got nails, like we've got nails. They're not quite claws, but they'd be sharper than a dog's claws, for example, and they do quite a lot of damage. So they do use those, but they've got teeth that are longer than a leopard's canines. And I've got a skull. We've just bought a skull. And the next time you come into the tent with us, I'll show you the size of an adult male baboon's teeth. They're terrifying. They're that big. They're razor, razor sharp. They're not, some of the leopard's teeth are slightly blunted from biting on bone. Remember that a baboon doesn't bite on bone much. It's purely for defense. So there are these razor little spears in the, in the baboon's face and they are, well, they're terrifying and that's why the leopards are so reticent to go after them. Young male leopards sometimes kill baboons and this chap's probably going to take his revenge when he goes independent. Females, they're too experienced, they don't go for it. And even big males like Anderson and Tingana, they'll avoid baboons. Baboons will be afraid of them, but there's easier stuff out here to kill than baboons. He's still up there. Ah, thank you, Chris. Well done. You've, I've forgotten all of these hyenas. You've been obviously observing these hyenas for a long time. You say, that is Ribbon, the clan male from our clan of hyenas. So that's great. I thought he looked, he had one rather familiar spot on his right shoulder. Um, but thank you very much for confirming that. So it is a male and his name is Ribbon. Thanks for that, Chris. Okay, we're going to move. Let's just go, I'm going to get try and get a a little loop around to that side we'll get a view of him I don't want I'm not going to hang around with him and we are also going to go and just do a little loop to the south and I'll try and get hold of Aubrey just to find out where the others are in fact let's go straight out this way Yeah, curious one, you say, can I hear the baboons still? No, I can't. They've gone, I think. I don't want to hang around here. Aubrey, do you copy? Hmm. Orbs confirm. Um, Kurula's gone back to the kill. and put Aubrey on. Okay, copy that. I haven't seen the other youngster, just the male there. Um, I'll come back to you if I can. Are the confirm honey vehicles there? We're not going to go back to Karula. I think there, there are too many vehicles there at the moment. Okay, copy. I'll, we'll try and come back later. No problem. Um, it seems that there are too many vehicles there at the moment. 
we've had an amazing sighting. So what we'll do is just do a little turn around here and see if we can't see the female. All right, why are we doing that and catching our breath and letting our heart rates go down? Well, a little bit. Let's head across to Steph. He's got an elephant. Wow, what an exciting sighting you've been seeing. Well, we haven't been chased up a tree. We definitely have been termite mounded by a herd of elephants and you can see that that bull elephant just heard my voice there. We have no other choice but to be on the termite mound we are. It gives us a beautiful view over the bush around us. And he was unaware of where we are. We actually came here to see one of my favorite trees, if not my favorite tree on Juma, this is that massive weeping boar bean on top of that gigantic termite mound. And as we climbed up here, he was standing on the other side. Now he can hear us. You can see that that very, those ears basically cocked above the level of his shoulders. That is an elephant listening intently. Now the herd of elephant that he's associated to is in an arc about 180 degrees from him off to your left hand side and our left hand side. And it's just one of those days where we're just being cautious. Blustery windy days like this today definitely add a measure of caution to what we do out here, especially on foot. He's just got his face buried in that bush that is at. Quite content to keep on feeding with us talking at this distance. And that to me is a very, very good sign. It tells me that we're sort of on that edge of that, that zone where he knows we're here but he doesn't really care. And that is the single best place to be with some elephant. Would an elephant be able to climb up this massive termite mound? No doubt. Would they want to? No, not really. Have a look here, the rest of the herd is coming out of the bush here, Dave. All over there, you can see that's the front runners of the herd. So a couple of hundred yards away, I'd say probably about 200, maybe 150 yards away from where we're standing now. And everywhere I'm looking, I'm just getting movement of feet. Now, that elephant is having our breeze blow almost straight onto her. I would fully expect at a point that these elephants would make a, a noise. Sometimes it's audible, sometimes we can hear it, sometimes we can't. And then they just sort of melt into the bush. Yeah, there we go. You see that? See that all of a sudden, that sudden movement? Now that was, that was an elephant that caught a big trunk full of our smell. Not that it's offensive, but I think that's in just in my defense. I think I smell quite nice today, as does Dave. I'm just seeing elephant everywhere. There's another one uh, through the gap there, just that dark shape across this, tree, this line of trees there. Don't worry about finding, we've got lots of alleys to look at close by to us. Now, the trick with what we're doing here now is where do we go to from here? This is, <laughs> I've now come and said hello to this beautiful tree which still hasn't got any flowers on. And uh, we've now got elephant everywhere. Now the decision is where do we go from here? Because <laughs> we've got elephant basically now in about a 200 degree arc around us. And although we're very safe at the moment, we won't be when we're down at eye level with them again. And I think, you know, the best thing to do in these circumstances is to just sit down on top of your termite mound and enjoy the sighting and that is precisely what we're going to be doing while you go back to James.
Well, everybody, he's chilled out. He's in the same tree. We did a brief loop around to see if we could find the female. We haven't managed to find her. We're going to have another look now. But Sh Hosanna is now relaxed. He's okay. He's just taking stock of the day. His heart rate slowly starting to drop. I can confirm that Karula is back with the kill, but she's on her own. And she's okay and not looking stressed at all, so I think you'll find that everything is alright. We are going to have a brief look for Shongile. And as Viam said, not easy to spot them in the trees. But you can see he's okay there. He's perfectly relaxed. In fact, he's going to sleep. Which he deserves at the back end of his real adrenaline rush. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, Sheila, I agree with you. You say things like this really bring home what a good mum Karula has been. You know, there are huge, huge dangers, huge trials. It's not easy raising cubs out here. Shadow is a testament to that. I mean, there could be other issues with Shadow. But yeah, Karula's 10th baby is here and well on their way to independence. And the little one up there now very much relaxed he's full of food so he's going to be fine he's going to come down a bit later i don't know that he'll come down on his own with us here so although he doesn't look like he wants to come down we're not going to sit here for long before we head off And Catherine, I agree with you as well. You say Shungile will be okay. You're sure of it. I'm pretty sure of it too. Let's go and have a look. Now, what I think Viam and I saw, we think, was Shungile basically off to the right-hand side there where I'm pointing, running down this way. That's certainly what Karula did. And I think one, we're pretty sure we saw two leopards going that way. So we'll just do a little loop around there and see if we can't spot her. Give me a little bit of a crunch here as we go over this dead tree. Oh dear. There goes the virtual... Oh! Um, fishtail it. I've got the virtual reality rig now very solidly stuck on a knob thorn tree and forward or back is going to destroy it. Mm. You can't take it off. There's a leopard in the tree. <laughs> um, we might have to link away if we can. Is there any way we can get away from here, Kirst? We've got to get this camera off the front. That's okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. We've managed to do it. It's okay. We're all right. Phew. Luckily, it's a cheap piece of equipment on the front there, hey, Vim? Okay. There's a bit of a hangy bit there. It's a bit worrying. Oh, well. I'm just, he's stood up and he's looking this way, which is not where his mum is. Maybe he can see a baboon somewhere around here. Now these marula trees would be ideal for a little female leopard to be hiding in. So we'll just do a very gentle, slow loop through here. We don't want to...
uh, very un I mean they don't kill baboons in this area a lot but it does happen from time to time and baboons are not tolerant of it then the male gave chase and we both Viam and I both think that he got hold of Shongi of uh, Hosanna there and I'm pretty sure that Shongi uh, that Hosanna gave him a bite gave him a slap and after that slap got made the baboon let him go ran up the tree and the baboon went up after him and then tried to grab him out of the tree and he managed to fight the baboon off and that's what happened then things calmed down karula has gone back to her kill and that is the lay of the land jason i don't see a leopard around here just an update from Andrew. I'm just going to try and find out what he said again. Sorry, Andrew. Can you go again with that update? I'm afraid I missed it. <coughs> oh, interesting update from Andrew. Copy. Thank you. He's uh, he's found a mvula. Hmm. Lam calls. Let's just listen. There. He's right, there's an impala alarming behind us. Okay, copy, thanks. We've just got some impala alarming around here. I wonder if it's not the little leopard. Let's head up through that way. We can go back to Karula, everybody, because they've made this a space there. All right, while we have a look here, let's head back to the lions with Taylor and we'll keep you posted with this rather difficult situation. We're still sitting with these wonderful lions and they've been providing so much entertainment this morning. I did get a little bit concerned at one point because they all looked like they were going to go back to sleep. And I do wish Karula and her cubs well, and I'm sure they'll be man manage to fend off those baboons. Well, they've managed to find a nice chunk of flesh. We've got a few more coming to join. And something that Chandra and I were talking about is that the teddy bear cubs are not quite teddy bears anymore. I can't believe that in 10 days they have almost doubled in size. It's quite fantastic. And I did a recount because finally the cubs all settled down and, and came back together and there are now eight cubs here. So I think when we had that bit of commotion earlier with the other lioness joining very briefly, I think she may have dropped the cubs off because there were definitely only six cubs when we first started and when we first arrived here this morning. So that's good. That's good to know. Here's one of the little teddy bears. Hello little one. Now you're probably looking at your screen and I'm sure you are wondering and I know Brent has spoken about it but you can see this little one does have a little bit of mange and it's doing fine. I don't think there's anything to worry about just yet. A little bit itchy but I'm sure mom is taking good care of this little one, grooming it and perhaps it will survive. I think I think they'll do well. The other cubs seem to be in fantastic nick. And this one doesn't seem to look too bad at all. Just a, just a few patches here and there, especially on the ears. But that could also be the flies biting their ears because I've seen the other cubs look like they've got a few nibbles from the flies and they can be quite pests. But remember that mange is a natural thing and it's something that does occur and it's important to control populations. That's why we have all these diseases and things around. But we'll keep our fingers crossed, but I have faith in the Unkafumas. I think they're going to do just fine. Remember, you've always got to have a positive mindset. Like with Karula, I think she's going to fend off those baboons. I don't think she's going to let any one of them touch her little cubs. She's an incredible mother. We've seen it. Well, she's proven it year after year. You can see this one just having a little scratch, licking in between the padding of the paws. There we go. Hello. <clears throat> now, it'll be quite interesting to see when we get the entire pride back together because they've been separated for a few days today. And uh, Bill, you were wondering 
when you get a pride of lions in that pride is there any lioness that's considered the queen now not from what i've seen however when i was down in the southern uh, sabi sand with a southern pride also five lionesses and now i believe they've got eight cubs too there was an old lady in that pride and her name was mandlev and she must have been about 15 years old i mean she was a really old lion but she looked beautiful the only thing that gave her age away was when she did a big yawn and she exposed her canines and you could see they were worn down slightly now we I used to see a little bit more dominance from her so that when they would go out and hunt she was often the first one up and eager and ready to go and getting the rally riled up but i think the the role between the lions is quite spread out what will be something to note it's definitely not too much of a hierarchical cycle like you see with the ele uh, the elephants I'm just going to keep quiet there's a bit of growling going on oh no stop typical whenever i say something they stop doing this don't worry i haven't forgot about my buffalo story either i will definitely tell you but it's just so exciting at the moment maybe in a few minutes while you're watching the lions i shall tell you you can see i can't believe some of these cubs are still suckling it's so funny i'm sure the mothers though are starting to produce less and less milk every day because the cubs are getting quite old now even the teddy bears must be almost i've been here a month so they must be on between four and five months now aging quickly that's something that i've noticed uh what we uh, unfortunately what we do as guides is we tend to forget that the animals age too. Now we're listening to all these little ones growl and make all strange sounds. Robin wants to know when do the lions or the youngsters get their adult voices. I think it's going to take them quite a few months before they eventually get the proper sound. We heard it this morning of them all attempting to roar and contact call and copy the adults. So for the males, I think they're only going to get uh, their proper, well, they'll be, have a good good sounding voice at about two years old. But I think that deepness of their voice is really only going to come in a few years after that. It'll just keep improving. And of course, as for the females, their voices aren't as deep as the boys. So I think around anywhere from about, let's say, a year and a half to two years, they should be sounding very much like adults. But for now... We get to enjoy the strange dinosaur sounding sounds that come from their voices. It reminds me of the Jurassic Park movies when uh, they make all the bizarre noises. Well, this female, she's found a good chunk of flesh. There, there really isn't anything left on this buffalo now. She, she, she's eaten it. She's reached the skin. They're going to have to keep turning it upside down and around and perhaps start eating along the legs. There's a few little chunks of flesh. You can see her sticking her head right in though. Here we go. So you see her pull and tug. And of course the little ones keep trying to steal her spot. You can see they're trying to creep in to try and get some good little bits as well. <laughs> I have a, having a good chuckle in the front. It sort of reminds me of these videos that everybody puts up on all the different social media where it's mom or dad and their kids and their kids follow them around and they can't even do anything without their little ones at their feet and it just proves you it's not just with humans it's with the animals too I mean, kids are everywhere you go you can't get rid of them which is not a bad thing of course but i'm sure it would be nice to have some peace and quiet and be able to eat dinner breakfast or lunch on your own see how she's using her paw now she pulls, rips away at the flesh. And all the cubs seem to be spread out there. It's like they don't need to rely on mom so much anymore. They're getting braver and braver as the days go by. Oh my goodness, my stomach's grumbling. I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> this is so lovely. Now it's quite overcast today. It's a really beautiful out here, nice and cool. I think we'll hang around with the Ngahumas just for a little bit longer. And while we wait, let's go back to James. And I think Karula has finally arrived at the Impala carcass. Karula hasn't arrived so much as we've found, well, we haven't found her. Aubrey found her and followed her. 
and she's pulled this carcass some distance. We're a good 200 meters, 600 feet from where we saw this kill this morning. And I think she's decided to take it towards a tree where she can stash it and then she can go and fetch the cubs. I think she's almost said to them, you stay where you are. I'll get this thing off the ground away from the baboons and the place where they are. She's dragged it straight into Juma. So she's pulled it away from Torchwood around where those baboons focus. And I think she's, oh, she's calling, no, she's not calling, she's just breathing heavily. And I think she's going to go and hoist it into a tree so that there's some safety for all concerned. You can see how heavily she's breathing. It's still quite a lot of impala left. It's not a male, it's a female impala. I think what I heard Brent say last night was probably that it's an adult impala as opposed to adult male impala. It's got no horns on it. She's just waiting, I think, trying to maybe ascertain where the cubs are. So I, I, have can't, I haven't told you where we are. If you picture where the first, where the kill was, where we saw them, um, the kill was basically sitting just inside Torchwood. Now what she's done is pulled it south and east, and sorry, south and west into Juma by about 600 feet, like I say. The male cub... Hosana is off to the north of where we are now, probably equidistant from the kill, so about 600 meters to the north, 600 feet, 200 meters to the north. Don't know where Shongila is at this stage. I think she's further south. We had some impala alarm calling and we went to investigate, but what I think that was, was probably them spotting her dragging this thing across the road. See definitely no horns, well, or ears anymore on that impala. She's there. there is a large marula tree, and I'm going to take the chance, everybody. She's heading towards it. I'm going to take the chance of not heading towards her, but going around the side and seeing if we can't get to a position by the tree so that when she does get there, we can see her pull it up. We also, of course, don't want to be too close to her because we don't want to affect her ability to hear the cubs, which may or may not be caught. I don't think they'll call her. I think she might try and call them, though. I think they will remain completely silent right now. gap here. Hold on everybody. Hello Alina, you're wondering while we negotiate through this narrow spot, she's going straight to the same tree. Alina, you want to know if the baboons carry disease and if they'd bitten Hosanna, whether they'd have uh, infected him with something. It's possible. It is possible, but remember the animals out here have profoundly powerful immune systems. So I think that he would have got over that. Which one do you think she's going to pick, Vim? Hmm? Looks like she's not going to pick either. Yeah, I must confess I agree with you. Just going to ease our way in here. great amount of artfark activity that goes on in this area. There, she's going to take it up this one. This is it's not the best view, everybody, but I think it's about the best that we're going to get. Let me move quickly, give her a chance while she has catches her breath.
quite all right, Jimpy. It's still very, very heavy. I'm going to just quieten my voice a little bit here now. Yeah, I think she feels it's slightly too heavy for her to take up a tree just at the moment. So she's going to sort of stash it underneath that thick bush there. And I think once she's caught her breath, because she's dragged it quite a long way, I think then she might try and put it up into the tree. Well done, Mom. What a morning you've had. What a life you've had. Hello, Lauren. Another one that is difficult to answer. Thank you for it. You say if the baboons had hurt the cubs or Karula, would the reserve have stepped in to help? The short answer is no. The long answer is probably. Um, you know, this is an iconic leopard and she brings a lot of tourists into this area very often and I think what you'd find is that although there's a general policy of non-interference, if there had been an easily solvable injury like, you know, maybe the baboon had torn a piece of fur off the back of her and, you know, with a simple stitching job it could have been fixed. I think you'll find they would have probably called the vet. But that is not policy. So the official stance would be no, there would be no interference. The unofficial one, I think, would have been if it was an seemingly easily solvable issue, then they would have got the vet in. Whew, what a morning. Michael, you're wondering if this talent of getting away from baboons runs in the family because Karula, at least Tandi, managed to escort her two cubs away from the baboons last time. I think it's largely, largely, um, I think it's largely instinctual. I don't believe that it's, it's necessarily genetic. Um, I think it's almost purely Sorry, I'm just listening. She's going to fetch the cubs now. We're not going to follow her. I'm going to let her be. Because I think that she needs a little bit of time to go and fetch the cubs. And I think it might be worth just sitting here and waiting. Oh, this is amazing. So, Michael, no, I think it's purely instinctual stuff that, I mean, it's, it's almost, Michael, like she's, they split, you know, it's, it's hardly like she, it looked almost like Tundi was trying to chase, I don't know if any of you saw that, but it looked like Tundi perhaps tried to lure the baboons away from the cubs. I'm not convinced that that's what happened. Um, and certainly with this, these three, they all ran in different directions. Karula was on the periphery, but remember, if she dies, those cubs will die, and so she won't take the risk. She simply will not take the risk that she could die as well. Um, and then a nice one, I forget the name, sorry, Kirsten, you'll have to come back with that, about whether or not her age is going to make a difference. It's Bill, thank you, Bill about whether her age is going to make it difficult for her to take kills like this up a tree or not. Yeah, eventually, you know, she gets a little bit older, it's definitely going to make a difference. But I don't think she's, I don't think yet. I mean, I've seen her hoist a male impala before. Whew. 
I think if you're all happy, I think we're just going to sit right here, if that's okay, and we'll just see if she doesn't come back with the cubs. So while we do that, let's head to the lions, find out what they're doing with the inimitable tailor, and make sure this time that she tells you her, <laughs> her buffalo story without the language she used. <laughs> Ah, oh, James, you're so funny. I would have loved to have seen what actually happened from sort of James's view. And yes, I did, I did possibly use quite a bit of foul language yesterday. <clears throat> so let me quickly tell you about the buffalo story. But we'll hopefully nothing interesting happens. Otherwise, I'm going to end up telling the story a hundred times. Right, so as you know, I'm the fossicker in chief. I do a lot of collecting of insects and a variety of different things for, for James. I'm just trying to get comfortable, but it's a bit tight in here. And uh, so anyway, I was going about my day as normal. I wasn't far from the tent at all. I was really close. Maybe I, I sort of walked out. Are they doing? I'm just going to keep looking back at the lines because they've, st they've stood up now. See, I know this is going to happen. I'm going to come back and forth to my story, but we'll get there. Now, some of the cubs also got up and moved away. Now we've got another lioness standing and listening. I think they're all anticipating the arrival of the rest of the Nkahumas. I think that's what they're missing. It doesn't look like anything sort of too interesting. Perhaps just changing position. Right, so I was out collecting and I, I actually I always stop and listen. That's one of the most important things you have to do when you're on foot. So I stopped and I listened and I said, I'll, I'll try, I'm going to do what I did. And I looked around and I thought I heard something I didn't. And I carried on walking and I was probably, I don't think I was more than about between 60 and 80 meters away from the tent. And I found a velvet ant. So I reached down and I took my my uh, multi-tool out and I, I picked the, the very gently I picked the velvet ant up and I put a leaf underneath it and I was walking very carefully not to drop this ant because I thought oh amazing I found something fantastic for James so as I'm walking back very very slowly I stopped and I had a quick look around again nothing and I'm not joking it was maybe 20 meters 25 meters from the tent and I stopped dead and it was amazing my whole body went cold and I heard the snort and I turned to my right so I went just like that my eyes grew about 10 times the size and I was maybe 30 meters away from a big buffalo bull <laughs> he looked at me and I think the way he was walking you know that typical typical buffalo stride head dangling down on the ground he looked up at the same time and I think he got a big fright so he snorted and I stood still but the next thing he started charging me and flat out now I'm close to him I can't tell you how close I was so I look and I was like oh I've got no tree to climb I'm not standing my ground anymore he was close and he was flat out charging now head down coming for me so I just booked it I ran straight into the tent shouting a variety of uh, words and then one of them being buffalo, that one I can tell you. <laughs> Into the tent I went, and James latched onto me, grabbed me, and ever and everyone was very confused. Thank goodness, nothing. I don't think anything was recorded. And David was in there too. And David, all David saying, "Is he gonna come back?" And then I was like, oh my goodness, imagine if he turns and chases us into the tent, we'd have to dive out the windows. It was very exciting. And I think I did see my life flash before my eyes. But now when somebody says to me, it's impossible that you can outrun a buffalo, I can tell them different. I'm quite proud of this. But let's quickly go back to the lions. They're obviously missing the attention of the camera. There's all sorts of things going. But don't worry, I come out un... Oh, sorry, Kirsty's telling me now. You probably heard that how fantastic that was. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I'm unscathed. I have one little scratch on my leg from a, a branch that hooked me, but I, that's nothing I've never had before. So I'm good. And we can see this, this lioness has applied another coat of lipstick to her lips. Mm. That almost sounded like a dog barking. Did you hear that? And it's again, it's that same young cub that we've watched since this morning, still eating and still having a go at this lioness.
the last <laughs> Come on, you've got big bellies, you've got tummies full of milk, you've got tummies full of buffalo. Oh, I think we're going to get a bit more commotion, especially if this other lioness comes over. Oh, they're all making lots and lots of noise. Mm. I'm also hearing some elephants in the background. I can hear them pushing trees amongst all the ooh, sorry, all the um, growling that's going on. She's found herself a tasty morsel. Hmm, delicious. Isn't that incredible? Look at that lovely bright red. That would make an amazing screenshot. It's like a Halloween photo. It'd give you some ideas. You could go as a lion who's just fed on a buffalo kill. It would probably look quite similar to the Joker's face though. With those bright red lips. But add a few ears. Maybe a mane. And I think you're good to go as a Halloween. Go as one of the Nkahumas or one of the Birminghams. It's quietened down. I'm really, really happy that we, ooh, as I, as I keep start talking, they make a lot of noise. Oh, just checking up in the air. See if it was a vulture that flew. Right. But I hope you've enjoyed the Nkahumas this morning. I think we're going to say goodbye to them now and let them rest peacefully and allow the other guards to come through. But I hope you enjoyed that. But let's go back to James and see how Madame Karula is doing. She came back, everybody, and she's just calling. I'm sure the cubs are just behind her. She was walking back, and she turned round and looked, and turned on and looked, and then called. And then she came back to the carcass and tossed some leaves on it. And I'm pretty sure that the cubs are just a little bit skittish to move into open ground. And between us, it doesn't look like it from where you're looking, but behind that thicket there's an open area. And I think they're just a little nervous at the moment. They or one, or I don't know. And when I say I don't know if there's more than one, I just simply mean in this particular instance. I'm pretty sure they're both fine. She came right back here. Going off onto the termite mound, I think there's a termite mound behind there. I don't want to move. I think she's going onto the termite mound to have a look see. I just don't want to move and make a noise. Well, that wasn't particularly exciting, was it, Vim? We can. Should we have a little move around, Vimpy? We'll just do a little, a little sort of foray around there and see. She's gone quite far, so we don't. We're not going to disturb her. Cotton in Colorado. You're wondering whether. Karula would have made sure that Shongile was all right before she went back to the kill to fetch it. Um, um, you know, I don't think so. I, I don't know that she knew where uh, the female was. I'm not convinced that she knew. Uh, but like I say, the thing with watching an incident like we watch, the leopards and lions will not risk their own lives for their, their youngsters. They can't afford to, because it, if they die, their cubs die anyway. And so there's no point in them risking their own lives. And so they are not, you know, she would never have risked her, she would ne wouldn't necessarily have checked on the cubs before she went back to feed. That said, I don't know that that's true. I mean, I don't know that she wouldn't have checked, so maybe she had a look and to see whether Shongile was okay, I'm not sure. It's interesting, these, are, these discussions all go into that um, area where we talk about animal emotions and animal feelings and, and uh, how much those drive what they do. 
And, of course, the big thing for scientists for so many years was, well, animals don't feel anything, they don't have emotions. And that was patently, obviously untrue to anybody who had a house cat or a dog, which obviously feel things. And I've been reading quite a lot about it lately. And far from being a kind of completely anthropomorphic response, she's gone off that way and Aubrey's following her there. So I think we'll just gently trickle along behind. Far from being a kind of anthropomorphic uh, impression of our own feelings onto animals or uh, reflecting our own feelings, Emotions play a hugely strong um, evolutionary role in how animals react to certain situations. And the emotion that a leopardess would feel for the dangers that her babies feel, or that her, that her babies are under, is hugely important because if she didn't feel that, she'd be almost psychopathic and she wouldn't look after them. She would feel no need to look after them. And so I'm pretty sure that what she felt during that um, you know, during that attack from the baboons was, was terror and uh, I think it probably quite closely approximated what a, a mother human would have felt with her children under such threat. And remember that a human being and a hyena and a wild dog, they will take far more risk than a leopard will and so will a lion because of course they live in a group. So they know that if you, if they get injured, they'll still be able to eat. Now I don't know what Aubrey's doing. I'm just going to call him quickly. Orbs, have you got visual there? Okay. What she's doing is she's gone back to where the first, where the kill was, uh, and she's calling them there. So she obviously doesn't know where they are. And Aubrey's leaving the area now. Okay, I think what we're going to do, everybody, I'm not going to go and sit with her. I want her to be able to hear what's going on. We're going to go back to the kill and wait there. While we do that, let's head across to Steph and find out what he's managed to step on with his fairly substantial size 11s, I think they are. Well, he may be stomping about the place, but he's not, in fact, audio, audible at all. Sorry about that. Not sure why. I'm sure they'll sort the problem out now. So, like I say, we're just going to head straight back to the kill. I'm not going to go after her. I wanted to have the maximum opportunity to hear what's going on. It's also why I'm trickling along at this speed and not going any faster than I am now, because I don't want the engine to roar, and I don't want there to be great crushing of bushes. So it is a little bit tiresome driving at this speed, but you know, it does afford us an opportunity to relax and get our heart rates down after what was a very stressful morning. And Person, can you confirm whether our rehearsal this afternoon is public or private? I'm just trying to find out. I keep forgetting which ones are public and which ones are private. So there is a, you will have a drive this afternoon, so don't worry, even if we don't see the Cubs again today, you'll get an update this afternoon. It will be from half past three to half past five, so it will be, it will be a truncated version as we do our rehearsals for TV, but we will come back here, so don't worry. I'm very interested that she she came back, checked on the kill, kind of looked behind as if to say, well, I thought they were behind me, but they just weren't. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Oh, 
I thought maybe I'd seen a little leopard cub in a tree, but I haven't. Okay, let's go back to the kill and we'll just lurk there. Meanwhile, the one positive of the morning, certainly from our point of view, has been uh, the fact that VM and I have both warmed up as a result of that action, and we're both very grateful for that. Okay, while we wait, I think I've lost this kill. While I try and find it again, let's head across to Taylor. She's got some, um, well, very, very nastily called part of the stupid five. We're in the Mara! We're in the Mara. This is the biggest herd of wildebeest I've seen ever in the Sabi sand. We cannot be in the Sabi sand anymore. We must have magically teleported into the Mara. This is incredible. This lovely breeding herd, as you can see, coming down. We actually, we're at the dam, at the dam cam. We're not far. You probably could see one wildebeest, which looks like the male that's off into the distance. And I think he's watching all these wonderful ladies that are going to come, come through. Now, it's actually a good spot for them to come down and feed on over here. There's all that lovely new green grass that's just coming through. You can sort of see the darker patches over the white sand. And it's nice and short, which is the length of grass that they love to eat. And, well, there's also a bit of water. Not that it's particularly hot today. So I don't know if they're going to come and have a drink just yet. But, I mean, this is fantastic. And this is what I love. I mean, I've been in, this, in the Sabi sand now for a year and a half, more than a year and a half. Like I said, I've finally just seen the biggest herd of wildebeest. I mean, isn't that wonderful? Now, we've left the Nkuhumas. I thought that they needed a little bit of a break. And there were lots of other guides who were wanting to come and see them. Isn't that quite, quite special to spend so much time with Nkuhumas? And I'm so glad, first time since I've been back. Now, just try and reposition. Oh, we've got elephants as well, Joe. We've got wildebeest and elephants. Hopefully, we'll be able to get around to them. But I want to have a quick one more look at the wildebeest because I know if is it practice, sorry, I couldn't hear Kirsty too well, uh, would like to know this morning um, <clears throat> are wildebeest aggressive? Now, you'd think because they just eat grass that of course they couldn't do any harm. But I must tell you, when I was working down in the Eastern Cape, so on the southeast coast of South Africa, there were quite a few attacks on people by wildebeest. Now, I think what happens is that people become quite complacent with the herbivores and think, things like the zebra, impala, bushbuck, wildebeest, and they think, oh, these animals couldn't do anything. Now, remember, they can weigh almost you know, 250 kilograms, probably quite a bit more than that, and they're armed with those horns. Now, I think if you were to come across a territorial bull, remember the males mark and defend territories. Can we show them the male that's in the distance just over there? We're going to show you him just to see how he's sort of standing higher up and looking down on his ladies below. That looks like a male over there. Now, they mark and defend territories practice. So this is what happens. He's got this beautiful area where he's got a permanent source of water. He's got lovely grazing. And, of course, he's got a bit of shelter and some bushes and things to hide behind. So this is the perfect area for a breeding herd to come through. Now, if you cling in to uh, this male's territory, perhaps when the females are coming into estrus, he could be quite aggressive towards you. And I think that's what happened. Look at all the elephants coming down now. Ah, oh, lovely. Here we go. We've got a line of elephants. And... I've seen it before where uh, I've had a friend who was unfortunately chased by a wildebeest, but he stopped. And I think that's what happens. Like I said, people become complacent and try to do silly things with the animals and they get too close or perhaps they, they just come across them on the wrong day, the wrong time of the month, whatever it may be. And they can indeed kill people. So it's always good to be aware. I'm going to reverse. the. I think they're going to go to the dam cam, the elephants. I'd like to obviously get a better view of them. Now, Jandra, are you ready? I'm nervous. I don't have any mirrors and now I need to go backwards on the damn wall. So I'm going to very quickly just focus over the back of my shoulder so I don't drive us off the edge. We're going to swing in over here. Oh, we did it. We didn't die today. It's obviously not my time to go just yet. Fantastic. So if you have a look at the dam camera, you should actually be able to see those elephants going straight there. And that's exactly where we're going. 
we're only about two minutes away. I'm just going to go down through the drainage and we'll zip on around. And that wildebeest is going to get a big fright and Frankie's going to be chased away by all those elephants. Come on, Jigger, you can do it. This is going to be fantastic. Oh, they're just getting there. Okay. Oh, they haven't bothered our friend the wildebeest too much. So you can watch the elephants. Oh, there's a hippo as well. Oh my goodness, look at all the commotion. Hippo versus hippopotamus versus wildebeest who's actually just having something to eat this morning. Okay, what I'm going to do is I do want to give them a bit of space. So I'm just going to just gonna go off the road slightly because I do need to give them space not much though look at this I'm gonna line you up perfectly so you can get fantastic screenshots how's that that is beautiful sorry I've parked on a bit of a angle isn't that amazing now remember to take screenshots and I look forward to seeing them all a little bit later so remember to hashtag safari live if you're sharing them on twitter or you can email us your pictures at questions at wildearth.tv and I'd also like to hear from you I'm going to snap one or two photos because this is just too beautiful not to take advantage of it's not every day that we get to see a beautiful big hippo and a lovely herd of elephants now I'm having obviously problems. I can't fit all the elephants in the screen because my lens is too long. Oh, the, the dramas that I, and uh, the troubles that I have to live through every day. Now I don't think the elephants are going to spend too much time here. I think they're just going to come down and quench their thirst. Look at that little one nudging mom away, saying move over, make some space. So I think they're just going to have a little quench, uh, quench their thirst, and then I think they will probably move on and continue with their day. Now it's not very hot, so I don't think we're going to see any mud splashing. No, already they're starting to shuffle and some of them are starting to move off. So it was really just, just to wet the mouth. Isn't that lovely? You can see the wildebeest now in the background as well, staring at the elephants. And off they go. Wasn't that perfect timing? And that's what safaris are often about. It's about just getting to the right place at the right time. And we indeed were at the right place at the right time. So I also must say a big thank you to practice. Because if it wasn't for your question, we could have possibly moved on and missed the elephants coming down. Because they were hiding in the thick bushes. So everything happens for a reason. Isn't that beautiful? Now they just seem to be smelling the air. You can see that elephant moving its trunk around a little bit in the front. Just having a little sniff. Not a particularly big herd. There's another one smelling the air. Maybe they're picking up on the scent on the lines. We're not too far away from them. And these elephants are downwind of the lines. So perhaps that's what they were smelling now. They're moving off. Let's see if they're going to go back down into the drainage line and maybe chase the wildebeest away for us. That would be quite funny, wouldn't it? Well, we're actually right in front of one of the lodges which is quite spectacular it just shows you how close and personal you can get sometimes you don't even need to go on a game drive on a little bumble you can just sit on the deck here we go and you can just watch all the animals go by I mean you think how often do you see the lions and how often do we see leopards on the dam cam now you'd be able to see all of that from the lodge and off they go the last two members catching up now from behind they're also finished eat uh, finished drinking here they are. Bye ladies. Wasn't that beautiful? Welcome Peter. Peter, you and firstly Peter's a new viewer. Peter, I hope you continue watching us. Sorry, I'm twisting around. I don't know which way my body wants to go this morning. Now Peter, we're actually out in the middle of Africa. But to be more specific, we are in South Africa at the moment. And we are situated in the northeastern corner of South Africa on a private game reserve called Juma in the Sabi San. Isn't that amazing? And we get to see all these wonderful, amazing animals without having to interfere too much. We obviously bumble around in the vehicle, so we make a little bit of noise. So in no way are these animals tame. They're completely wild. The lions hunt for themselves. I don't know if you were watching earlier, but we actually had lions eating a buffalo. Oh, look at, there go all the wildebeest. They've been chased away now. They, look at that, they were not happy. Now it does look like a migration. 
I think those elephants were just getting a little bit too close for their comfort. You can see they're all staring back. Not very impressed with the elephants, of course. And like James, I think James was saying yesterday that the elephants are definitely the, the king of the jungle. Size really matters. And there are very few creatures and other animals that, um, that will tackle on an elephant. But I hope you enjoyed that. But let's go back to Steph and see how his walk is going this morning. Our walk is going fine. Thank you very much, Taylor. Yeah, it's going so well with the rest of everybody. It's just nice to be able to explore as much as we have done today. One of the things that we managed to do was follow a lilac breasted roller for the last couple of minutes. The reason for that is that this time of the year, lilac breasted rollers are busy nesting. They are cavity nesting birds. In other words, they like to nest in the hole of trees made by woodpeckers or barbets. And we've managed to find a, a lilac breasted roller's nest. Inside this peltiforum, this, uh, this African wattle, is a branch, quite a prominent branch going up through the middle of the tree. The arced branch in the middle that sort of arcs off towards us, relatively speaking, has two holes in it. Just at the arch. You'll notice it a little bit. So let's go from the bottom of the tree all together. So we come out the bottom of the tree, there's three prominent wings. One to the left, one to the right, and then one going straight up. If we follow the branch going straight up, all the way, all the way, and until it arches, yeah. on the arch are two holes in the tree there. And inside the bottom arch is the nest of a lilac breasted roller. Now we're just sitting over here waiting to see if the lilac breasted roller actually returns. I'm wanting to know, let's see if we can see her. I heard her just now. Just trying to see if we can see her in one of the trees over here to show you. But they've got some babies. Probably find the female is sitting on the eggs at the moment. They both have turns. Both the male and the female have turns sitting on the eggs where the other partner will then ferry food backwards and forwards to that one. Quite nice. Now usually with whole nesting birds, the eggs are quite brightly colored, white, um, or at least a reflective color so the birds can actually see the eggs relatively easily. And the eggs are usually round and that's so that they always fall to the center of the nest. So even in the dark, the birds always realize that the eggs are most likely to be in the center of the nest. Birds that nest on cliff edges have eggs that are tapered if you hold up a chicken's egg, you'll notice that it's tapered towards the top. And that's so that the, when that egg rolls, it always rolls in a circle or relative circle. And that's to stop the egg from rolling off of the side of a cliff or rolling out of a poorly constructed nest. So generally speaking, the rounder the egg, the, the more cup shaped and the more, uh, the, the more uh, vessel shaped is the nest. Usually the tapered eggs with the most tapered eggs are, egg, are, are nests that are very poorly constructed, nests on the ground or nests on the, on the edges of cliffs and it allows that egg to rotate around itself. Isn't that interesting? Right, I don't see these rollers anywhere. Let me take a quick scan of the trees around us and see if we can... I heard that roller the last time was about a couple of minutes ago. They flew out of this tree when we got here, but now, of course, because I want to show you. <laughs> Alright, we're going to go and have a closer look, but while we're getting closer to the nest and look for this, Taylor's hippo has climbed out of the water. You've got you just in time. That's an interesting angle, Chandra. That is indeed a hippopotamus exiting the dam and i think he's going to take full advantage this morning of the lovely cool and overcast weather that we've had to go for a bit of a munch i think he was just waiting for the elephants uh, to move out he looks a bit stiff still looks like he hasn't quite woken up just yet let's see what you get up to oh right and as we watch this bum disappearing over the edge of the dam wall. Goodbye, Oxpecker. Goodbye, Mr. Hippo. I hope you have a lovely day. Let's go back to Karula, who's made an appearance again.
Well, she has made an appearance, everybody, but she's made it with only one cub, and it's the male who we knew was okay. Now, I don't think that's to say that she hasn't, that the, that, that the female is in trouble. So that's little Hosanna. And I, I just think she doesn't know where Shongile is. She's calling still. So she's got one of them in tow, and she wouldn't, uh, you know what, you know what's happened here, I think. She wouldn't have taken him to go and find the other one. So once she found one, she would have come back here, and she'll, she might dump him here, and then go looking for her. That could easily happen. So I don't, I think it's definitely much too soon to worry about Shungile at this stage. And so he's going to have a bit of well-deserved meal after his horrible shock this morning. Interesting to see now if she goes off straight away. No, she's going to have a bit of a rest. So this is quite strange, or maybe it isn't, I don't know. The more you postulate about these things, the more nonsense you tend to talk. Hello, Faith. What a nice question from you, and it's uh, it's the opposite of what you'll think. You said, you said, when I first started doing this job, was it difficult for me not to try and help the animals or not to want to help the animals? Um, no, it wasn't, because I came from a science-based background, and so I was very kind of, well, I was religious about science, if you like. Um, I have modified my views a lot more now, and... I mean, I've seen the obvious emotions that animals have, and I, in turn, feel a lot more emotional about the animals that we see out here. And so my inclination to interfere, although I would still fight that inclination, I must confess to you, although, so my inclination to interfere sometimes would be quite strong, but I would still fight it. So it's actually, it's, it's harder for me now to detach myself emotionally than it's ever been. She's still looking off in that direction. So I wonder where little Shongile is. Hopefully by this afternoon she would have appeared. But what I think we'll do, let's sit here for... Let me just check how much time we left. Okay, in fact, I'm probably... Let's quickly head back to Taylor. She's got something really interesting to show you. It's our friend, the hippo. He's limpy, the hippopotamus, today. He's come out of the water. And we've got some zebra who are very uncertain of this hippo and are doing a wide berth around the hippo. And hopefully they're going to come to the pan. There they are. Now you can see the hippo is limping slightly. I'm not sure what, I didn't see any obvious injuries, but perhaps it's something internal, maybe he's a bit stiff, maybe he's got arthritis, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but there he is, there he's disappearing. But I'm sure he'll be alright. When the adrenaline kicks in, you won't believe what, how amazing that is. Look at me, I outrun a buffalo that was very close to me as I dived into the tent, so I got some superpowers from those adrenaline. And here come the zebra who are doing a little trot towards us. They're parading for us. Are you going to come and drink? That would be very nice. I think they're going to come to the little pan below the main dam and have a little drink, but they've spotted us and they're sussing us out, making sure that we're not lions or anything. 
waiting patiently at the water for them to come through. This looks a little bit like what I would imagine a Tosha to look like. With the sand and the fallen trees and in this one little pan. I've never been, so I'm only, I'm only speculating. But it'll be nice. Lovely zebras coming towards us. But note how they are very cautious. Now, I say this jokingly when I say that they look at us as if we were lions. But <clears throat> when you come to the seasons when there isn't a lot of rain around and the dams seem to be a little bit drier than normal, it's actually very, very common to see something like a leopard or a lion, even a cheetah, just scouting and hanging around a permanent water source or an area that there is water and actually just wait for their food to come to them. Now, we can see this is the stallion. And you can see he's up in front, which is quite typical. And normally the stallion takes the lead when they do approach the water to suss out. Right, let's go to Steph very quickly for a fluffy feather and we'll hang around. A fluffy feather, a fluffy bird, and we'll hang around with the zebras. This happens to be the longest chin spot batter sighting I've ever had. But just have a look at this. little bird is about four yards or so away from us at the moment, sitting in a tree. And just giving us the absolute best sighting. Of note with the chin spot batter is that chest bar and then those beautiful eyes. Just have a look at that. Oh, amazing. Now that long sharp bill used to pluck insects out of the air but generally to glean insects from the branches that it lives in. So they'll flit a male and a female in a, in a pair or flit from tree to tree and will go through the leaf litter due to their small size and pick insects off very very carefully and very thoroughly. I've watched some of these birds feed before and the amount of insects that they can actually see and spot is just incredible. I envy them that. But just have a look at this. David doing a fantastic job keeping this camera literally dead still. And just giving you all those chances to get those screen grabs of these rare little birds. Obviously, they're not that rare. They're quite common. But because summertime hides the activities behind leaf foliage, these dry season views of them are just absolutely superb. And I must say, I mean, now we're probably into our third or fourth minute of watching this little bird. I don't quite know what he's doing. He might actually just be... Um, presenting himself to a female that's in the area or he's just busy watching us watching him that is fantastic and one stick just in the way <laughs> of course it wouldn't be a walk if there wasn't a stick in the way now the males and the females are quite different from one another Although they all have the general size and shape of each other, the female, I can't actually remember now off the top of my head which one is the brownish chest band. I think it's the female with the browny chest band, but the male with a more solid color. I could be mistaken, it could be the other way around quite easily. But all of them with that beautiful white eye. Oh, yellow eye in actual fact. In that black face. Giving me a decent enough time to actually look at the claw structure as well of this particular bird. And I see that their back claw is relatively elongated. I've never noticed that with the battises before. They're obviously a perching bird, which means they have three toes forward and one toe facing backwards. And that long back toe allows them to grip slightly wider branches. And I would imagine that that would be a help for them on larger diameter branches and help them to hold on to larger diameter branches, effectively increasing their feeding range. Can't think of another use for that. Feeding in trees also gives them access to spider webs. Now, Fran, you've just said that this is bird number 97 on your bird list. Congratulations, Fran. Wow. 
97 is noteworthy, I'll be honest with you. And Chin Spot Baptist is definitely one of those that you need on your list. So congratulations, well done. Now they, these birds, gleaning insects from the trees that they have, have access to spider webs. And it's the spider webs and the lichen that they build their, their nests out of. They do these most delightful cup-shaped nests. And quite often, yeah, absolutely. Sherry, all the way from California, has just asked me to repeat this name. Sherry, it's the Chin Spot Battis. B A T I S and Chin hyphen Spot. Chin Spot Battis, as opposed to the Cape Battis, which we also find in the country, but this is the only Battis that we find here. And I must be honest with you, a better sighting you are unlikely to have in years and years. This is the longest chin spot batter sighting I have ever had in 17 years of doing these safaris every day. Well, nearly every day, not quite every day, but nearly every day. And David just doing a superb job. He's got, the, he's got his camera, which is essentially handheld at head level. <laughs> Just trying to keep it nice and still there, giving us this view of this usually quite fast flying bird. It's just awesome. But it has come to that time of the day where we get to say goodbye to you for now. And at least from myself and Dave, I just want to say thank you for joining us on the bushwalk today. Thank you as always for your questions and your comments. I'm going to send you through to Taylor and that hippo. We're watching a couple of vultures. There were a few, well, Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg were also joining in. But this looks like a white-backed vulture that we can see soaring around. Now, like I said, there were a couple of them, and they were trying to catch a thermal. And I think it's going to be quite difficult for them today to try and catch a decent thermal. You can see lots of wing flapping going on over there. And normally, <clears throat> they will find a stream of hot air. And catch it and then they sort of start to circle and then occasionally you get a tornado of vultures what well, looks like a tornado that's going around and the vultures just circling going round and round and round and i know that we have got a couple of new viewers today so if you're wondering if you ever see a vulture circling if that means that that's a kill not necessarily because when they catch those thermals they do have to do the circular motions and often sometimes well often people will get confused now, they are obviously struggling quite a bit today. I don't think there's any thermal right there, unfortunately. They can reach quite a few thousand meters up into the sky. It's quite, quite special. We're going to go carry on along this road over here. And I'm hoping we're going to bump back into maybe the elephants, maybe Mr. Hippo in the drainage line, perhaps those zebra again. They zooted off. Something gave them a bit of a fright and they ran away. So maybe we'll catch up with them as well. Now, I haven't been seeing too many vultures around in terms of sort of catching up all the thermals. That's something that I'd love to be able to see and to be able to show you live is uh, quite a few of them though. So not just one or two desperately trying to catch a thermal, but maybe 50 or 60, maybe even 100. Imagine seeing a 100 vulture in the sky sort of twirling around. It's quite special. It's really beautiful to see. But I think we're going to have to wait for sunnier and warmer days to come through before we can hope to really see anything like that. Now we're going to have a careful look here because this is exactly where our hippopotamus entered into this Tamboti thickened drainage line. So we're going to do a little... Oh, there he is! Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Hippopotamus. I hope my brakes didn't wake you. But he has now found a lovely spot under the shade of a quarry. So like I said, it is overcast and cloudy. So it's not too bad. And he's decided to take a rest. I think that watering hole is going to be quite busy and he doesn't want to be disturbed anymore. So he's come to have a little a little siesta out here, which is lovely. And you can see him fast asleep now. I thought that perhaps he was going to get out and, and maybe go for a bit of a graze and take advantage of, like I said, of this lovely cool weather. Normally, we, normally we're only seeing uh, the hippos grazing at night because they've got a very thin, sensitive skin, and they need to obviously keep nice and cool. Oh, hello, James, Richard. <laughs> so 
So as as you heard, James Kirsty was just talking about you now. So James Richard would like to know, with the hippos not having as long and dense sort of set of eyelashes like perhaps the other animals, how do they protect themselves? Now, something with the hippos you must remember is that we don't normally see them moving through thick vegetation all the time. And the food that they are really feeding on is grass. So they don't have to worry like elephants, perhaps like impala, uh, like giraffe, of getting any foreign objects. So sort of anything thorns in their eyes they normally they've got quite a thick layer uh, because they're not reaching into any trees so I don't think there's really any need and they spend most of their time in the water and actually submerged so uh, possibly there, there just isn't really too much of a of a need for them and unfortunately I wish I could actually show you his eyelashes because that would have been quite nice to see but he's just lying in a bit of an awkward spot but it'll be quite interesting to find out a little bit more about that but Unfortunately, it's come to that time of the day where I'm going to have to say a farewell to you. But I hope you enjoyed this morning and I, I hope to see you all again soon. And I'm sure I'll see you a little bit later this afternoon. So for myself and Jandre, have a wonderful day. You thought that you'd seen the last of Steph. Well, you haven't. He's just up ahead, everybody. Um, but that is not the point of what I really want to say. That is that we left uh, Karula, we went to see if we could see Shongile perhaps in one of the trees around about where they were chased. We didn't see anything there and so we left. They, I'm pretty sure, are going to be there this afternoon and no doubt Brent or Jamie will go have a look at them this afternoon and see if they can't find what's happening there. I'm pretty sure she's going to leave Horsana to eat and she'll go off and see if she can find Shongile. Now, of course, you've seen Steph today quite a lot, but you have not seen uh, David. Hello, David. Hello, there is David, everybody. And there is the great and inimitable Herbert Causa. Herbert, of course, is very well camouflaged, as you can see. David is dressed, I'm not sure what David's dressed like. Anyway, the less said about that, the better. Okay, we will see you back for breakfast shortly. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. David does have camouflage pants on, I suppose. Ah, now you are asking what my one word was to describe this drive. Um, you know what? I found it quite harrowing. It, it was, I just, like I said, I don't feel kind of that yay feeling that you get after you've watched a lion kill or something like that. I just feel harrowed by it. Why we attach ourselves emotionally so much more to uh, cats than we do to impala? So as Viem was saying to me, it's all it's it's no problem watching a buffalo being killed. Yes, it's harrowing, and it's it was well, not harrowing. It's um, it's a, there are lots of emotions, but you come out of it thinking, wow, that was amazing. You come out of watching what I saw today, feeling well not traumatized, but I mean there's an element of feeling slightly traumatized by it. Uh, Viam, what will you say? One word to describe? I was thinking toiling. Toiling? It was hard work. It was hard work, he says. And that's because, I mean, I guess to, to spot what we spotted was difficult. And it was difficult to see what was going on. There were baboons running everywhere, trees everywhere, leopards running all over the place. Then there was the hyena. So, yeah, I'm going to go with harrowing. Uh, it's, it's certainly from an emotional point of view, it was quite harrowing. So thank you all for watching it with us. And then I know Jason, for example, said he had to turn off. He couldn't watch it. He was having a heart attack at the time. And I quite understand that particular perspective. All right, everybody. That's going to be it from us today. A big thank you to all of you for coming along on the ride. What a drive it was, and kahumas, and leopards, and baboons, and the rather harrowing experience of watching those baboons chasing the leopards. So thanks for coming and commenting and sharing it with us. Big thank you to Viam on camera today. Thank you, Viam. Well done. Good job. And of course to David and Steph and Herbert and Jandre and Taylor. We'll see you this afternoon at 3.30. Bye-bye.